Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this full CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also, remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about cryptography, which is the process of transforming readable plain text messages into an unintelligible form and then the later reversal of that process. Cryptography can be used to send sensitive data securely over an untrusted network such as the internet and it uses authentication and encryption methods to do that. Cryptography provides these services to the data. First up, authenticity, which is proof of source. So proving that the data really did come from you think it came from. Then confidentiality, which is privacy and secrecy. So you can send the data over an untrusted network. And if even if somebody else is able to sniff that traffic, they're not able to read it. And integrity, meaning it's for sure it is not being changed in transit. And finally, non-repudiation, which is quite similar to authenticity. So authenticity proves that you are talking to who you think you're talking to. Non-repudiation means also that they cannot deny that it was them later. Okay, so with our cryptography, we've got both symmetric and asymmetric encryption. With symmetric encryption, the same shared key both encrypts and decrypts the data. And you can think of the key basically as being similar to a password. So with symmetric encryption, that shared key is known by both the sender and the receiver, and it must be kept secret. They're the only two parties that know about it. Symmetric encryption is fast. So because of that, it's used for large transmissions, such as email, secure web traffic, HTTPS, and also IPsec for VPN tunnels that we'll be talking about later. Algorithms that are used for symmetric encryption include DES, Triple DES, AES, and SEAL. DES and Triple DES are really older algorithms now, so they're seen as insecure, not used so commonly now. More commonly used today would be AES. So let's have a look at how symmetric encryption works and how it provides confidentiality. So here we've got the host on the left and it's got some data. The data says hello and we want to send that securely to the host on the right over the untrusted network. So the host on the left encrypts that data of hello with the shared key of 123. And when it does that, it comes out with garbled encrypted data, as you can see down at the bottom here. It is then that encrypted data which is sent across the untrusted network. So if there's anybody on that untrusted network that is able to sniff that data, they can sniff it, but it's not a problem because they can't read the actual data that we are sending. They only see the encrypted garbled copy. It then comes out at the intended target, the host on the right, still in the encrypted format. It then decrypts it with the same shared key of 123 in our example, and it then comes out in the readable format again of hello. So that's how we were able to get that sensitive data of hello across from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side over that untrusted network securely. Okay, so that was symmetric encryption. There's also asymmetric encryption as well. And asymmetric encryption uses private and public key pairs. So with symmetric encryption, it's, a share, it's the same shared key on both sides. With asymmetric encryption, it's a private and public key pair. The way it works is data encrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key and vice versa. So anything decrypted with the public key can only be decrypted with the private key. Anything encrypted with the private key can only be decrypted with the public key. If something's encrypted with the public key, it cannot be decrypted with the public key. 
And if something's been encrypted with the private key, it cannot be decrypted with the private key. So they're like a male, female of each other. On, only the private key must be kept secret with our asymmetric encryption. The public key can be shared everywhere. You'll see how this works as we go through this lecture and the next. So the public key, as I just said, can be available everywhere. It can be known in the public domain. With asymmetric encryption, it is slow as compared to symmetric encryption. So because of this, it's used for smaller transmission, like exchanging our symmetric keys and also digital signatures. I'll explain how those work later on in this section. Algorithms for asymmetric encryption include RSA and ECDSA. So let's have a look at asymmetric encryption in action. So in the example here, the host on the left has got the public key and the host on the right has got the matching private key. How we can use asymmetric encryption for confidentiality first. So here, the host on the left has the public key of the host on the right and it wants to send the data of hello over there securely. So it takes that data of hello and it encrypts it with the hosts on the right's public key. So it does that, and then it then comes up with the garbled data. Now here, the host on the left does not know the private key of the host on the right. It only knows the public key. So it encrypts the data for the host on the right with its public key, the host on the right's public key, and it then sends it over the network. That comes into the host on the right, comes in as the encrypted garbled data, it then decrypts it with its private key and it comes out with the original data of hello. Now, with this, it allows anybody to send data securely to the host with the private key because all hosts are allowed to have the public key. But the host on the right with the private key is the only one that has the private key. Nobody else has that. So it's the only one that can read the message. Again, if something's encrypted with the public key, it can only be decrypted with the private key, not with the public key. So the host on the right is the only one that can read any messages that have been encrypted with its public key. Other hosts with the public key cannot read that message. All right, so that's how it works for confidentiality. We can also use asymmetric encryption for authentication and non-repudiation. Here, the traffic is going to be initiated from the right-hand side. Now, again, it's the host on the right with the private key. The host on the left has got the matching public key. So the host on the right has got some data which says hello. It encrypts it with its private key. It then sends that encrypted copy of the data over the untrusted network to the host on the left. The host on the left then, in de then decrypts it with the host on the right's public key, and it comes out with the same original data of hello then. So here, the host on the left could have said to the host on the right, okay, if you are who I think you are, take this data of hello, encrypt it with your private key, and send it back to me. The host on the right then does that, it comes back to the host on the left, it decrypts it, and it does say hello, which is what it was expecting, so it now knows that it is talking to the host it thinks it's talking to over on the right. It's authenticated it, and also the host on the right cannot deny that later, because it's the only one that would have been capable of doing that, because it's the only one with the private key. So that provides authenticity of the host with the private key, all receivers need to know what is the genuine public key for this to work. Next thing is HMAC, hash-based message authentication codes. And HMAC codes provide data integrity. So it makes sure that it has not been altered in transit. The sender creates a hash value from the data to be sent using a symmetric key. The hash value is then appended to the data. The receiver hashes the data with the same shared key when it receives it. And if the hash values are the same, then that proves that the data has not been altered in transit. This is also used for large transmissions, for example, email, secure web traffic, and IPsec. And the algorithms include MD5 and SHA. So looking at how HMAC codes work, here the host on the left has got the data which says hello. It then hashes that with the shared key of one, two, three, and it comes out with a hash 
which is in a garbled format, as you see here. Then when it sends the data across the network, it's got the original data, which says hello, and it's got the hash value appended to that. That comes into the host on the right. It sees the data and the hash. Then it hashes that data with the same shared key of one, two, three. And if the hash value matches on the right is what it was in the left, which was sent over, that means that the data has not been altered in transit. Now, with the example here, you can see that we sent the data in plain text there. So what the HMAC code does is it just checks that data is not altered in transit. Now, normally the data will be encrypted as well. So normally here we would have the data encrypted with a symmetric key. We're also taking a hash value as well. So by encrypting the data, that provides the confidentiality. Having the HMAC code, that provides the integrity. So we use them both in combination with each other. Next thing is key distribution. So cryptography can be used to send sensitive data securely over an, an untrusted network, as you've just seen. And symmetric key encryption is used for bulk data transmissions because asymmetric encryption is too slow for that. With key, with our symmetric encryption, each side needs to know the shared key, and this can lead to a key distribution problem. Let me explain what the problem is. So for example, when you buy something online, you want your credit card details to be encrypted over the internet. You don't want anybody else seeing your credit card details. Now, the online store can't send you the shared key over the same internet channel. It's not secure. So if you're shopping online there and somebody's sniffing your traffic and the online store sends you the shared key over that internet connection, then anybody that's sniffing it can see the shared key so they can read the data that comes later. They can still read your credit card details. So for that shared key to be shared with you, we need to have a secure out of band method of doing it, not sending it over the same internet connection. And obviously it's not practical for the online store to phone up every single customer every time there is an online purchase. So we need some other way of getting a shared key over on both sides of the link. That's our key distribution problem. And the solution for that is PKI, public key infrastructure. PKI uses a trusted introducer, which is the certificate authority for the two parties who need the secure communication. Both parties need to trust the certificate authority and it acts as a go-between, which allows them to share a shared key securely. And I'll show you how the process works in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad-free right now, then you can click on the link above my head or in the description to enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.